Hey, good evening and welcome to Ask Caswell or the Caswell Cook Show or whatever this thing that we've been doing for the last three weeks is. We're excited to have you with us tonight. Every night you guys have been tuning in. It's been really great. Um, we didn't quite know what to do during this whole time and we had to put my show on hold. And then uh, with the help of my producer, Ben Barber, we figured out this live streaming world and we're, we're going all over the place and we've had amazing guests so far. Seven nights a week we've been on the air, and I want to thank a lot of my past guests. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan McKee was one of my first guests, and we just did his new show tonight called Ask Dan. Um, we've had Tom Wopat from the Dukes of Hazard on this week. Uh, we've had John Ford Coley from England, Dan and John Ford Coley. We've had uh, Terry Sylvester from the Hollies. And coming up uh, this week, we've got some more great people. We've got Billy J. Kramer. So if you have any Beatles questions, Billy can answer them for you because Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas were managed by Brian Epstein, came from Liverpool, and John Lennon wrote his first two big hits for him. So he'll be here with us Thursday. And we've had Jonathan Edwards on the show. And coming up uh, next week, we've got Susan Cowsill from the Cowsills, and we also have Joey Mullen from the band Badfinger. So it's amazing. Now, I have two guests tonight. I'll tell you my second guest before I bring on my first. My second guest is Raven Kelly, and Raven has been doing a great job making masks. Uh, Sisters Who Sew is what she's been doing and making a lot of headlines around for her good work. But she also was a child actress, uh, and be through her adult life, she actually uh, played young Tina Turner in What's Love Got to Do With It, and she's got a lot of stories to share with us about the people she's uh, been in the movies with. My first guest tonight is an exciting guest for me, and she's going to be coming to us live from Florida, uh, and she's no stranger to Westerly. Uh, her and her husband, uh, of course, created the wonderful Ocean House and uh, the Week of Pug Inn. But in addition to that, Deborah Goodrich Royce is a wonderful author with a, a huge bestseller last year, Finding Mrs. Ford. And she's also an actress, and we want to ask her about some of her some of her movies that she was in. So let's bring on uh, Deborah Royce. Hi. Hey, how are you? Very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing all right. What What are you doing to pass the time in quarantine? I am writing. So I'm working on a third book. I have finished a second book, and I'm working out the contract with my publisher on that for it to come out next May. It's called Ruby Falls. And I'm working on a third book, which uh, because I happen to be in Florida, I had not intended to set it in Florida, but Florida's kind of uh, seeping into my consciousness now. So I'm going out on my bicycle here and there safely, uh, <laughs> distance from other people and poking around, seeing how this is all gonna play out. Well, before we talk about finding Mrs. Ford, because there's a lot to talk about, and I want to definitely get into that, but I want to talk about your acting days. Do you mind? No, I don't mind. So Ben Barber, our producer, is going to put some photos up on the screen that might jog some memories and some stories. So, so I, wanted okay. to go, I wanted to go back. Uh, so your first movie was 1980, Those Lips, Those Eyes. And then you were in a, a host of movies, April Fool's Day, Remote Control, um, uh, St. Elsewhere, an episode of Sa in, in 1986. And of course, uh, you were in All My Children as Silver Kane from 82 to 83. So tell us about, uh, well, I don't know if you can see some of the photos that are going through, but tell us about how you got into acting. Well, I was in college in Ohio. I was a foreign language major of all things majoring in French and Italian and minoring in dance. And it was this minor in dance that kind of led me to the movie world. So I was doing summer stock theater in the summer of 1979 out in Cleveland, Ohio. And a movie came to town with Frank Langella, who everybody would know, and Tom Hulse, who played Mozart in Amadeus, not yet at that point. And this was a movie called Those Lips, Those Eyes that you just mentioned. And they were casting for background dancers. So I thought, I can do that. And I went down and auditioned and was hired as a background dancer. And this was a movie about summer stock theater. And we did this dance number uh, as Dutch girls in old New York. And the choreographer was a man called Dan Serretta. If we have any Connecticut people watching, he was the choreographer for many years 
for the Good Speed Opera House in East Haddam, Connecticut. So Mr. Soretta kept saying to me, you should come to New York and audition for me. I will be casting for the summer season of, of the Good Speed Opera House. So as a Midwesterner, I was very literal. And I thought when he said I should come audition for him, he meant I should come audition for him. Anyway, the screen turns around. I, I came to New York. I auditioned for him. I was not cast in the summer season of the Good Speed Opera House. But I spent about a year really pursuing a Broadway career as a dancer. And I kind of got to the final callback of so many Broadway shows, but I really wasn't good enough. And I, I, it became clear to me after a year and I thought, well, I'll, I'll give acting a try. I think I can do this. And I had more luck and more success. I started doing commercials right away. I did a lot of national commercials like Coca-Cola and um, Shower to Shower Powder with Meg Ryan. That was my first commercial. And a product you've never heard of, bacon flavored Cheetos. There's a reason you've never heard of it. <laughs> did you have to eat them? We did, we did. Yeah. And in the Coca-Cola commercial and the bacon flavored Cheetos, I danced in both of those. It was the era of the movie Fame, if you remember that. So both of those commercials were set in high schools and we were dancing up and down the corridors of these high schools singing either about Coca-Cola or Cheetos. So uh, within a year, so I started screen testing for a lot of soap operas and within a year I got that contract role on All My Children, which was, you know, a big step. What's that like when you get on a soap opera and, and what, how did that change your life when all of a sudden people knew who you were walking down the street? That was kind of crazy. So soap opera fans are a little bit different from movie fans because of the nature of the animal. It's five days a week, 52 weeks a year, and they see you as the character. Often, if you're not Susan Lucci, they don't even know your name. So you are taken as that character. And one of my favorite moments, I'm saying that sarcastically, I got, I played a very troubled character. Silver Kane was a very difficult young woman. And I got a letter from a fan that went on for pages and she was explaining to me. So I played the sister of Susan Lucci's character, Erica Kane. And in these many pages of the letter, she explained to me uh, how she had two daughters who had the same kind of rivalry that my sister and I had and the kind of therapy that they sought. And, uh, you know, we weren't really sisters. <laughs> it w was the whole experience fun for you? Soap operas are fun. They are pretty grueling work because, as I said, five days a week, 52 weeks a year, 12 hours a day, your day goes from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. at the studio, but you also have to go home and read. So it's it's a very intensive experience. And playing the, the kind of troubled character that I played, it was a bit debilitating. You know, when you do a movie or a nighttime TV show, you're you're not so steeped in it all the time. So I was heartbroken to be written out after a year but in the end it was really a good thing and now there's there's a movie you and i have talked about this movie my favorite movie that you were in just one of the guys that yeah. was such an amazing movie I, I i was a teenager in the 80s or just becoming a teenager and i thought that movie was just unbelievable and i know that you guys have gotten together you've stayed in touch with the actors i've seen yeah. reunions so what was that like to work on that movie and, and how have you stayed in touch with all those actors over the years it was fantastic. I got to Los Angeles. So after all my children, Paramount Pictures flew me out to LA to screen test for a pilot with Christopher Lloyd. I got the pilot, I did it. You, you remember him, Back to the Future. And, I do. Uh, taxi, <laughs> got this pilot and the pilot wasn't picked up, but I got a boyfriend who was my co-star in this thing, a guy called Grant Forsberg. And the other thing I found out was how much more work there was at that time in Los Angeles. So when the pilot wasn't picked up, 
I was back in New York when I found out, but decided to move to LA. And I was cast uh, in just one of the guys, I think it was a Columbia picture and, uh, or was it Warner Brothers or Columbia? Anyway, I, my dear boyfriend Grant and I shared a car. We rented an apartment in Beverly Hills. There was a lady who had this apartment so that her kids could go to Beverly Hills High School. And then she sublet it to this guy who was a ski bum and he was going up to Colorado. And then he sublet it to us through the Screen Actors Guild bulletin board. And he said, do you know how to drive a stick? I said, um, yeah, yeah, I know how to drive a stick, which I did not. Anyway, I got the apartment <laughs> and this car, which I think was, uh, I don't know, a Ford Pinto or something. Anyway, Grant and I had that one car. So I drove Grant to this audition. He was auditioning for the nice boyfriend of, of the Joyce Heiser character, the boyfriend that she um, she keeps her secret from, her double identity from. Anyway, Grant didn't get the movie, but I did. Oh. That was a long way of telling you that story. Well, it was a good story. I like to hear it. Um, the other uh, the other thing I see the picture just got put up. Uh, you were in 90210 as well. I was. I had... I did I have one child or two then? So I was a young mother and that was a lot of fun. That was shot way out in Santa Monica because we were shooting at a beach club where the character Brandon worked and I was the older waitress girlfriend. The older waitress girlfriend <laughs> of Jason Priestley. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's great. So you, in the early 90s, you 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 stopped acting for at that point it was in the early 90s that's because you had kids and you were moving in a different direction it is uh my first husband and i had two children and his career was not really taking off he was not an actor he was on the other end of the business and there was a lot going on in la there was that whole terrible rodney king situation and we had the opportunity to move to France. He had grown up there. He was invited by his mother to come back and help her with the project. So we moved to France. And while there, I was hired by a French film studio as a reader, which became this long journey toward actually writing myself. And film studios all have readers in their rosters. It's not a salaried position. It's it's piecework, if you will. And you're hired screenplay by screenplay or, or novel by novel. You can read novels to read the material, synopsize the material for the executives at the studio, and then write a page of comments about what works or doesn't work about it. So that so was my shift. Your shift. So now tell me what inspired you to finally in 2019 publish your first book, Finding Mrs. Ford. How did that how did that journey begin? I know you and I had talked. I had seen you a couple times. You said you were working on the book. Um, how, how do you go from coming up with a story and getting it to a publisher? And then right. tell us about that journey. Well, obviously, I took the slow road. So for me, I had been writing all along. After I worked for the studio in France, came back to New York, and I was actually hired by Harvey Weinstein, to be the story editor at Miramax Films. And I did that for several years in the 90s. And that was um, a really important part of my transition to becoming a writer because Miramax was really at the epicenter of the film world at that time. And my job was to work with writers. So I was working with the best in the business, having the opportunity to edit their work, which was very formative for me. I ended up leaving Miramax because the work was just too intense. And after going through a painful divorce, I met the man I'm married to now, Chuck, who, who is a, a wonderful citizen of Westerly. And one of the projects we took on, one of the early projects was the restoration of a cinema in Stamford, Connecticut called the Avon. And through the Avon, we developed a relationship with Gene Wilder. Gene, uh, Gilda Radner had had a beautiful farmhouse in Stanford, which when she died, she left to her husband, Gene. 
Jean had remarried a wonderful woman, Karen. And anyway, they were very involved with the Avon. And we developed a writing correspondence. And he said to me in his wonderful way, if you can picture his voice one day, he said, are you a writer? I think you're a writer. And I said, well, you know, kind of, sort of, maybe. He said, I would be honest to read anything you've written. So I sent him this screenplay I'd written with a writing partner, one of the writers from Just One of the Guys, by the way. And Gene Wilder read it and was very encouraging. And so I, I got very involved with these writing groups, but I was raising children, married to Chuck. We had a lot of projects, as you know. And for me, it was really when the youngest child left the house, which was 2015, that I thought, if I am ever going to do this, I need to figure out how to get serious about it. So 2015 was really the point at which I got serious about writing a book. And for any writers out there, I decided to declare to people that I was writing a book, which Chuck found very embarrassing because, <laughs> you know, there was obviously the, the likelihood that I would not succeed. But for me, it was a really important step along the way in that going public and saying I was doing it, I realized that I might not ever even complete the book. It just helped me to put that flag in the sand and it, it committed me a little bit or a lot. It, is, is writing like something that's in you that you need to get it out? Like you, you need to get it on paper. What is it that drives you to want to write something? Yes, I think you said it very well. Uh, there's something about telling a story. I love to write fiction, but I think there's so much truth in fiction. I like couching truth in fiction. And by truth, I don't mean factual events and details. If you've read Finding Mrs. Ford, it's a pretty crazy plot, and it's not my actual life. But, oh, look, there's Sunil. Hi. Uh, and just as a plug, you're going on his show on uh, I am. Friday. Yes, Friday. Yeah. See, I feel like I'm in Westerly. This is so much fun. <laughs> um, but I, I love putting truth into fiction because I don't I don't think I could write nonfiction because it the research is so intensive. And I do research anyway for fiction, but I can then budget a little bit. Um, so yes, there's a compulsion to tell something and there, there's a deep fulfillment when you push through that frustration. As hard as it is to say that one true thing you're trying to say, when you finally get it down on paper and you think, yes, that that's the thing that I have felt. That's the thing that I have experienced. And what happens is if you've experienced it, and you, you've been able to say it, somebody else has too. Maybe not everybody, but somebody. So when you released the book, uh, did you realize the response it was going to get? I mean, last summer, you were like on top 10 lists everywhere. People were, I mean, it was a big deal. That book really took off. I think if I could speak in just raw honesty, I think like most people, I hold two possibilities at all times. And one is very grand. We, you know, we're all kind of mentally accepting our Oscar for whatever we're doing. And the other <laughs> is very low where we're thinking, I don't even know if I can finish this thing. So reality always lies somewhere in the middle so I had dreams for the book on the one hand, fears on the other. And for me, a lot of it is just putting one foot in front of the other and working very hard to be right here in the moment where I am. Because like anybody, I can get pretty far in the future past. So I have to tone that down. So, uh, first of all, Fighting Mrs. Ford is the book we're talking to Deborah Royce. Um, in case you're just popping on here, I see we have quite a few people on different formats here. We're actually, we're, we're simulcasting. We're not only on, on our page, we're on uh, Westerly Live. There's a whole bunch of pages and we're on YouTube. We're, we're kind of streaming everywhere. We figured out how to do this in the last three weeks. But um, 
w- tell us for those who have those people who have not read the book and without giving anything away, just just set the tone for what this book is about, the characters. Well, everybody, place yourself in beautiful Watch Hill, Rhode Island. Uh, the book begins in the summer of 2014 when the FBI shows up at the house of a woman, a beautiful seaside house in Watch Hill on a perfect sunny day to ask her about a man from Iraq that she claims she does not know. And the FBI says to her, that's kind of interesting because we just picked up this guy having taken a plane from Baghdad to Boston and he was in a car on his way to your house. You go back to Detroit, which happens to be my hometown, in 1979, where our heroine, Susan Ford, is a young college girl who takes a summer job in a nice ladies boutique and meets this wild, crazy girl, Annie Nelson, who convinces her to ditch the nice job and go get a job in a fairly questionable disco on the edge of Detroit. And this disco is heavily populated by this group of Iraqis They're called Chaldeans. They are Catholic Iraqis, and it's a big population in Detroit. So at the setup of the book, you get a feeling right away that Mrs. Ford is not really telling the truth. You get the feeling that maybe she did meet this guy in the summer of 1979. So the book goes back and forth in the two time periods, Watch Hill 2014, Detroit 1979, as you begin to peel the onion of what it is she's hiding and her past that she thought she'd kept long buried for 35 years catches up with her. I love it. And where can we get this book? Amazon.com? You can. And also at the wonderful Savoy bookstore, the paperback just came out yesterday. And I know that the Savoy has them in stock. They will mail them to you. You can do curbside pickup. I signed some bookmarks, which I mail to them there. But the paperback is really fun because it has a reader's guide that I wrote. So it it asks questions for book clubs that really deal with the themes that I think are important. And it has a sneak peek at the first chapter of Ruby Falls, the thriller that I have coming out next year. Awesome. Well, when the new one comes out, you got to come back and tell us about it. It would be my pleasure. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us. There's a lot of people that are commenting and and uh, and love hi, that everyone. you're on with us. And uh, say hi to your husband, who's probably off the screen. I shall. I shall. <laughs> and he wants me to say, the United Theater is doing stuff online. They're streaming. So all sorts of content is available in this new virtual world that we all are living in. So go find the United Theater on Facebook and on the website, and you can you can see everything the United is up to. And by the way, from a lot of people in Westerly, thank you to you and your husband for the Ocean House, for the United Theater, for all the wonderful things you've done for our town. We really appreciate it. We thank you. Well, thank you for making us feel so welcome there. We love Westerly. Well, we'll see you when this whole thing's over in Watch Hill. And maybe okay. one night we'll have to have a screening of just one of the guys somewhere. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank see you, you next Pat. time. Well, good You're to see welcome. You. Bye. Good to see you. Bye. All right. Well, that was uh, Deborah Goodrich Royce, and uh, I-, I talked to we talked to uh, Chuck, uh, her husband, off off camera uh, before we came on, but he was he was in the background there talking. Um, and thank you all for watching. We've got a great audience on all the different streams tonight. A lot of people, Tristy, Tony, uh, Annette, uh, Tammy's watching, Cindy's watching, Vinny's watching, Debbie, Ben. Oh, so many people. And now I'm going to, uh, uh, I have another guest, another guest. But first, let's bring on Ben Barber so I can figure out where we're at in this program. Except I can't hear you. Ben. Why me? Well, because I don't know who we've got backstage waiting to come on. <laughs> um, I love it. Uh, we have, do, we have, do we have Allison and Raven? Yeah, we have Allison and Raven. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, somehow bring both Allison and Raven on together. And I'll introduce both of them. I'm wow, it looks it almost looks like and, I'm, I'm and get... Ben's Ben's gone away. So uh, first we have uh, in the top of the screen next to me is okay, well now next to me on the middle of the screen, okay, Ben's <laughs> playing with us. Uh, we have Allison Patton who is uh, 
famous also for being the director of the Westerly Band. And by the way, I see you're seeking new recruits for the Westerly Band. So we are. That's good. We'll, we'll get that out there. And then we have Raven Kelly Dinwoody, who's down below in the three shot here. Hi, guys. And, and I wanted to have you guys on. We're going to talk to Allison first, and then we're going to uh, spend some time with Raven on her acting career. But tell us, uh, Allison and, and Raven, uh, about the masks and how you came up with doing this. Uh, for, tell us what it is that you're doing, Allison. Uh, we're, we're making masks and we're giving them to hospitals or whoever else needs them, stores or whoever needs them. Yes, yeah, so we are, thank you Caswell for having us on and thank you to your producer, Ben. We really appreciate being here today. Great interview with uh, uh, Miss Royce there. So hi, Miss Deborah. Um, Alice and I, it was so cool. We go to church together. We've been friends for quite some time now. We go to church with you at Christ Church. Um, mm -hmm. My husband's one of the acolytes under your leadership, Caswell, as you know. Um, my husband, Sean. <laughs> I don't think he's yeah. under my leadership. I think he's a cohort. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, at church, just randomly one day, uh, Lisa Ornberg, who's also my other god sister, like Allison is, uh, reached out and she said, hey, you know, you should come by Allison's on Monday night. You know, we, we get together and we sew and, you know, and she's like, you want to have any interest? And I was just like, oh my gosh, it's so funny because long ago, back when Sean and I were just engaged, um, I had one, I had my wedding gown altered and we were sitting outside the alteration shop and he said, and he saw a sign that said, you know, sewing lessons, whatever. And he says, you know, dear, you're such a little Susie homemaker. You're so great with the kids. You like to cook and clean. You're a great chef. He's like, the one thing that you don't know how to do, though, you don't know how to sew, do you? And I said, that's right. I don't. So that was it. I, I did a little sewing show when I was a kid with, if you remember uh, Designing Women, you remember Meshach Taylor? Mm -hmm. the, the black guy on Designing Women, his daughter and I had a little sewing show that we did as kids. And it was a pilot. And as Deborah was just telling you guys, sometimes pilots get picked up, sometimes they don't. That one didn't. And I have never sewn ever since. Um, <laughs> and I did a little bit of sewing with my Aunt Donna, Donna Tarpley. Um, shout out to her in Atlanta, Georgia, when I was little. And then now Allison came to me and Lisa, and they're like, hey, you want to sew? I'm like, yes. <coughs> but let's keep it a secret. Let's not tell Sean, we're gonna surprise him. So we started sewing together and we uh, sewed Allison's granddaughter, uh, Julia Rose, daughter of, uh, of Dana Pancara and uh, my son, Weston Warren and Lisa's little boy, Colton. We all sewed the matching little sweatshirts. And that's all it was supposed to be. This literally just happened in January. Wars truly did not know how to sew worth anything, I want to say, two months ago. <laughs> so, but I want to say she, she caught on quickly. She so, caught on very quickly. All, all, all due respect to Allison. She's an awesome teacher. That's who taught me. So that's why I was like, when you asked me to come on to talk about the mask, I said, we cannot leave out Allison. She's the she's the teacher. She's the main instructor. And uh, when I, long, the, how, the three how, of us were together and she asked, she was like, we should have a name for ourselves. And I said, I know, I got it. Sisters who sew. And that's and how it started. Allison, how long have you been sewing? I don't think I ever knew you sewed. Oh, yeah, I, I do. Um, I, I used to sew with my grandmother when I was a little girl. And then I, when my kids were young, I sewed for them. And, and then I stopped for, I don't know, quite a while. Because when, when my kids decided... They didn't want to um, me to sew for them anymore. They wanted store bought clothes, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, um, and so now um, I have a granddaughter now. So I picked it up again and started for her. And Lisa wanted me to catch on, uh, wanted me to teach her also. So we just included Raven too. So you've been Hundreds friends with years. you. You've been friends. <laughs> There's Scott in the background. You've been <laughs> you, you've been friends with with Lisa for how long, Allison? Since we were eight years old. Oh wow! Yeah, we we kind of pick up. We we think each other's thoughts, and there she is on there. Oh, Lisa. <laughs> There's Lisa. Hey, sis. Yeah. yeah, we've just been best <laughs> friends since eight years old. That's awesome. Well, Allison, thank you so much for for doing this, and thanks for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. How can people uh, contribute or find out to help with you with sisters? Thank that so. 
they can contribute to us. We just started today our GoFundMe page. Um, we have a GoFundMe page. So if you go to GoFundMe and you search Sisters Who Sew, you can donate there. Um, there is like a little box there that you can donate. Uh, just to show you some of the work that we do, everybody. So um, this is a mask, a really cool one that uh, Allison made. So you've got oh, Batman. Allison, that's great. That's for our superheroes out there, our nurses and doctors. We're also doing this just so you know for some of our forgotten heroes. Uh, a lot of people in the media aren't talking about our, you know, funeral directors and funeral workers and the morgue staff that unfortunately they're dealing with, you know, COVID-19 infected bodies. And where's their support? And I've been bombarded with messages from different funeral homes and messages. Um, so we decided this is a mess that I made. It's a little nice. bit of a somber, more of a somber tone. We're doing more hunter greens, blacks, grays, uh, navy blues. Uh, for the uh, morgue workers. We're sending these out to the morgue workers in New Haven, New London, also in Providence as well. And as you can see here on all of our masks, they have a little filtration pocket and you can take this. This is what you call a little N95 filter. This is a PM 2.5 filter. We just insert that inside and you pull it through and you've got a filtration mask right there for yourself. So. We do a little bit of everything. We do stuff for kids too. I just did this for my nieces. So hello, Maya and Lucia, if you're watching. I did a little Disney princesses for them. Um, we do the Patriots. We got the New England Patriots there. We also have Mickey Mouse. And I wanna definitely say, um, Allison and I were so honored by uh, the president of the Ocean Community uh, Chamber of Commerce, President Kanicki, Lisa Kanicki, thank you for blessing us. She reached out to us. She said, hey, I like those anchor masks that you guys are doing. I started doing these anchor masks. This is the outside, and the inside is the lighthouse print, as you can nice. see. Anyway, she liked them so much, she requested them for herself and for some chamber members and members of the community. And also, she surprised us and said, I'd like you to make some for Governor Raimondo. So if you're watching wow. the news and you see Governor Gina Raimondo wearing a nautical print mask like this, it's from us. It's from Allison and I from Sisters Who So. Well, awesome job you guys are doing. Thank you very much for doing it. And Allison, thanks for joining us today. I'm going to hop on with uh, Raven for just a couple minutes to finish up with her. But congratulations on what you've started there, Allison, to you and Lisa and to Raven. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. All right. Now, Raven, you're all mine now for the next 10 minutes. <laughs> you're, ready for the, you're, you're ready for the 20 questions? Oh, boy. I, I don't right, so know. Here, my... here's, what, here's what I want to know. I want to know about your acting. First of all, I've known you for a few years now uh, since yes. you guys came back to town. I had no idea about all the stuff you've been in. When you said you played little Tina Turner with Angela Bassett in uh, Angela, is it Bassett or Bassett? Bassett. And Angela Bassett, you yes. played young Tina Turner in What's Love Got to Do With It. That was enough yes. for me right there. There's the picture <laughs> up there. Oh my gosh, you, that's, uh, that's a, like a, a, I think it's the Oscars after party when I was like, I, I think eight years old. <laughs> wow, there's yes. you and Angela. So now and Ben's going to and Lawrence Fishburne as well. Ben's going to roll, roll these pictures. Go a little that's, slow, Ben, because I want Raven to me. tell us about these. That's a picture of me with uh, my two-time uh, movie dad, uh, Samuel L. Jackson. I played his daughter. Uh, and many of you all that are writing fans, you love novels like John Grisham novels. His very first novel was A Time to Kill. This is before he wrote The Firm and The Pelican Brief. Uh, his very first book uh, was A Time to Kill. It's about a little black girl who gets raped and uh, by some racist guys in a small town in Mississippi. And her father actually seeks vengeance and he kills them on the court steps on the day of the trial. Um, and so then well, the rest. That, that, that's an uplifting story, Raven. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, exactly. Jesus, it's, what a downer. <laughs> right, you know, but but I will say this. It was a beautiful experience. A lot of people ask me, they're like, oh, my gosh, what was that like for you? You played a little girl who was raped, you know. It's got to be hard. 
Yeah. Um, and stories like that, it is imperative that they are told because it's indicative of our, of our society to teach lessons like that about, um, you know, basically racial justice. And um, and also if there is a right and a wrong way to approach things. And uh, in that film, it starred uh, Sandra Bullock and Matthew McConaughey. And I was directed by um, Joel Schumacher. That's crazy. Oh. Now, this picture we've got up here now, I, that looks like the beautiful Natalie Cole. Yes. May she rest in peace. Oh my goodness. One of my one of my favorite people in the whole world. Um her son actually was my godbrother, um, wow. Robbie, Robbie Yancey. And um this was her first movie. It was called Lillian Winter. And as you can see there, I'm with my G Ma, as I call her, my adopted grandma. Uh, Marla Gibbs. Um, I have two adopted grandmas, uh, Marla Gibbs and Cicely Tyson. And uh, I met G Ma on the set of this movie. Uh, <laughs> it's so funny because uh, many people, when they see her, they're just like, oh my gosh, that's Florence from the Jeffersons. Yes, it is. Uh, so, all the Jefferson fans out there, she also was on Blackish as well. Um, that's Marla Gibbs, TV icon. She was my grandmother in this movie. And I, uh, I, Natalie Cole, I, I was, I had the privilege once of uh, going to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony back in 2000. And I went with my little TV show at the time. And um, it was, I, Paul McCartney was inducting James Taylor. It was an amazing night, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Oh, oh but, yeah. Uh, but Nat King Cole was getting recognized, and Natalie was there to talk about her dad. And I got to meet her, and she was so beautiful. Her eyes were just like, like, like I, could, I just looked. I was like staring and, and at even her. Even more beautiful person on the inside. I will tell you an interesting story. Um, when I did that movie uh, with them, it was Lillian Winter, and I, I was only, I think, ten, nine or ten at the time. I didn't know who Nat King Cole was. I, I, I mean, I knew the Christmas song when I, I recognized that. Are but I you forgettable? I didn't know. And so my, mom, my mom brought her music and she says, absolutely not. You have to know who this icon is. And so my mom schooled me and I listened to her whole album until I knew every single song by heart. I knew Non Dimentico, I knew Mona Lisa, I knew everything. And so one day I'm in my trailer and I'm singing Unforgettable. And the hair and makeup ladies are walking by and they hear it apparently. And then they go and they tell Miss Natalie and they tell Miss Natalie about my singing and how it sounds so good. And I'm, I know all those parts and this and that. So next thing you know, we're on set, we're filming and Miss Natalie looks at me and she's like, so I hear you've been singing my songs, huh? And I was <laughs> like, what? And she's like, yeah, she says, I want to sing with you. And I was like, no, I can't sing with you. She says, I want to sing. She's like, let's do Unforgettable. And this is on set, everybody watching. And she's like, I'll sing my dad's part. You sing my part. Wow. And there wasn't a dry eye. Like everybody was like crying. And I, I didn't understand the semblance at that time of what historical moment I was a part of. But yeah, that movie, um, we, we filmed that and, um, it, it was just, we lost her a few years back and um, her son reached out to me, um, Robbie, and he was like, you gotta come, I, you gotta come to the funeral. And, and, and I went and paid my respects, but afterwards I left and they had a private family dinner afterwards. And he's like, where are you, sis? I'm like, I want you to be able to grieve with your family. He said, you're family, you get here. And not even, Less than two years later, we lost him actually, and he had a, a heart a heart attack. So, that's but terrible. um, yeah, but that was a great film. And if you remember Family Ties at all, um, Michael J. Fox's little brother on that show, Brian Bonzel, the youngest kid on Family Ties, he was in that movie with us as well. If you keep scrolling the photos, Ben, we're gonna see a couple more. And I, I oh, think we're gonna, we're this gonna is see. me with my godmother. I have I have multiple godmothers. I have Billy Barnum as my godmother and. Um, and also this is my aunt Yolanda, as I called her auntie Yoki. Um, this is actually very, 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 uh, hard to talk about. Cause she's like my, one of my second moms here. Um, she passed away when I was in college. This is at, um, my first college graduation. I had 
multiple degrees, but she um, she's Dr. King's daughter. Um, you know, obviously we all know Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He had four children, uh, two girls and two boys. And this is his oldest child, um, Yolanda King. And she was also an actress as well as a civil rights um, leader and ambassador as well. So she was an author as well, a beautiful woman. And I mean, she, she was a part of the woman that I've become today. I mean, you know, I just, I used to cuddle in the bed with her and we used to make tea and pasta together. And um, she, she's just a blessing and a beautiful, beautiful woman. Uh, we did two films together as well. Um, we did, um, for anybody who's fans of Rob Reiner movies, uh, like When Harry Met Sally, Rob Reiner directed that. He, um, he directed my Aunt Yolanda here um, and I in a movie called Ghost Mississippi, starring James Woods and Alec Baldwin. James and, Woods, a Rhode Island actor, James Woods. Yes, James Woods, who, oh, that's a funny story. I gotta tell you this. <laughs> Okay, so we when you start a film, once you get cast, they have a they have a table read. And so you get your everyone gets your scripts and you're sitting down and all the actors are there and um, the producers and directors are on hand to hear the table read. And so it's just so that they can get notes and all of that and the actors can meet. It's a whole camaraderie thing and also so that you know they can give notes and writing notes on actually hearing the, the dialogue. So anyway, I'm seated out of all the people that I'm seated next to uh, in the cast. I'm seated next to Mr. Jimmy, as I called him, but James Woods during and his lines. You know, he plays he's playing Byron D. LeBeckwith, who is the man that assassinates civil rights leader Medgar Evers. Um, and so he's like a Klan member in the movie and all this. So he has to say the N word quite a bit in his dialogue. And he's sitting next to. Me, you know, 11 year old little black girl. And so he lets me know, he's like, sweetheart, I just wanna let you know before we start this reading, I have nothing but the deepest respect for African-Americans. I love your community. And I think you're a beautiful little girl. And the words that I'm about to say, I would never say in real life, I'm just playing a character. And right then Rob Reiner comes over and he's just like, Oh, please. She's been in a million movies. She knows it's just acting. She's a professional. And so that you was almost her. you almost say that like him. By the way, Ben, keep scrolling the pictures. <laughs> so but in that movie, um, uh, Miss Whoopi played my mom in that movie, Whoopi Goldberg. Wow. Um, this is a picture of me uh, with Mr. Matthew, Matthew McConaughey and I. Um, that's an interesting story. So he was the attorney in A Time to Kill. Um, so he's known me since I was like, you know, I, what was I, 10 years old? He's known me since I was 10. And so I was filming actually an episode of Entertainment Tonight on the same lot that he was actually doing the movie, The Lincoln Lawyer. And I found out about it and I went over and I talked to um, the PAs and I said, hey, you gotta tell his wife I'm here. And so his wife, Camilla, decided to surprise him. He got off set came around the side and there I was. And he scooped me up and picked me up like I was a little 10 year old, but I'm a big girl now. <laughs> so yeah, that um, that was a fun day. And I got to see him and his little boy, Levi. Um, but yeah, he's a beautiful man, great spirit, good person. And so tell us as Ben scrolls through some more pictures and feel free, cause there's a lot Ben, so just keep scrolling. Um, tell us how you first got into acting by the way. Oh, yes. Um, oh, that's a picture of me with my grandpa, Bill Cobbs. Um, he was Whitney Houston's uh, dad in the movie The Bodyguard. And uh, he was in Night at the Museum, for those of you that remember that one. Um, but he he and I, we were at Starbucks in Beverly Hills and we ran into uh, Caitlyn Jenner. So that was us. Um, I got started at a very young age. Uh, that's my third, my third television series right there. That was on ABC um, in 97. Uh, that's me with uh, Kirsten Warren and Bo Bridges, Liz Vassy, and uh, Jason Robarts, Sam Robarts. He's Sam Robarts and Lauren Bacall's son, actually. 
the the guy next to Liz Vassie in that photo. Um, that's a TV show that we had there. But um, there's me with George Takei from, yes, yeah, Star Trek. And we were doing his famous, oh my, <laughs> that he likes to say. Oh my. <laughs> But um, no, when I was little, I started off very young. My mom was, um, my mother was actually uh, a graduate of South Carolina State University and also uh, Juilliard. She had done, done some uh, summer stock at Juilliard as well as University of Alabama. And so she had a background in theater. So when I was little, I would go around with her as she did her one woman show. She did a one woman show of doing Harriet Tubman that she traveled with. And um, eventually, like, I would try to, you know, imitate what mommy was doing on the stage because I was quite the little ham. And um, some of my mom's friends were in advertising and there were like stores like Hex and Kessler's and I don't know, Upton's and Sears, a bunch of sh uh, stores. They would have they would need models. And I modeled for Macy's and did all that when I was a little thing. And um, basically, I got my first television series when I was three years old. It was on NBC uh, and it starred uh, Regina Taylor, uh, Golden Globe winner Regina Taylor and uh, Sam Waterston. Um, all of you Law and Order fans out there and fans of uh, Grace and Frankie on Netflix. Um, so yeah, Sam Waterston and I, um, I was on that television show and I played Regina Taylor's daughter on that show on NBC, I'll Fly Away. And that was um, my first series. We just passed the Roseanne picture. Tell us about your, your time on Roseanne. Oh yeah, so real quick, I wanna comment. This is a picture of me with Alex Bronza. He is an amazing man, uh, sweet, sweet, dear soul. He actually was a creator and ex executive producer of uh, Maximum Bob, the TV series that I did on ABC with Bo Bridges. He also created 21 with uh, Kiefer Sutherland and uh, Homeland as well. So Roseanne, yes, this was a historical moment I was the first uh, African American child to ever be, ever to star on Roseanne, ever to be on the show. Um, and this episode um, was very controversial at the time. Um, it, the episode is about DJ, you know, Roseanne's little boy on the show. He can't wait to be in the school play. Um, the school play has a king and a queen, and they're the leads of the play, and he's up for the part of the king. And there's this pretty little blonde girl in the class that he thinks is going to get cast as the queen. And so he's like, he can't wait to get the part so that he can kiss the, the girl in the play. And my character gets cast as the queen in the play. And it's a whole episode where he comes home and he doesn't want to be in the play anymore. And his parents, Dan and Roseanne, are completely confused. They don't know why, because he made such a big fuss about being in it. And then it comes out that he's racially uncomfortable and that he has all these uh, inside racial uh, issues. And he's like, I don't want to kiss her because she's black. And it becomes this whole issue in the episode. And Dan is okay with it. Roseanne is not okay with it. And she she's like, no, black people are just as good as us. They, you know, they're loving people and anybody that doesn't agree with them is ignorant. And it's a, it was a, big deal at the time. And um, we won a Peabody Award for that episode. And we also, uh, ABC and Roseanne and, and, and myself, the, the cast, we received an award from, from then President, President Clinton at the time, gave us an award for uh, achieving um, racial acceptance in the world with the episode. So that was a pretty big deal. Awesome. Now, Ben, uh, I think we have a couple of more pictures left. We need to get a couple more stories out of you. Well, there's your husband. Yes, that's wonderful. If you go from the side, you see uh, Mr. Bo Bridges there like I, and his wife, Wendy Bridges. Then you have me, a very pregnant me with Weston Warren in my belly. <laughs> uh, that was actually- and, and, now I, and now he's in the background. Yes. <laughs> and it's um, this was the 20th anniversary of, of Maximum Bob. So we had a reunion and the reunion was actually the same day of my Los Angeles baby shower. So 
<laughs> that's uh, that's just a funny note. And uh, that's me with uh, uh, Beth Grant right there. She's in between me and Mr. Bo. You may have remembered her from several movies. Um, she was in the movie Jackie. She played um, uh, uh, First Lady, Lady Bird. Um, she played her in that. And she also, ironically enough, we were together before in A Time to Kill, the movie that I did uh, with Samuel Jackson and Matthew McConaughey, where my character was raped, she, her son was one of my rapists in the movie. So we did that movie, and then we also did Maximum Bob together as well. So she's fabulous. And uh, what else do you got for pictures there? There's a that's from the same. Oh, that's movie. another cast photo from Maximum Bob. Yes, indeed. So tell me, as as a uh, as one final story. Um, did you get to, uh, did you did you get to when you played uh, a young Tina Turner and what's love got to I'm, so, I'm sorry I keep coming back to this movie but it's such a good such <laughs> No a good but did movie. you say Caswell did you did you you need to tell what you said to me about vacation bible school do you remember what you said at from church I remember we were talking in the hallway down by the classroom and now remind me what I said. I was this about, is before was you even knew, this is before you even knew that I did that I played young Tina Turner. You I came up to me. Oh, I was I said, oh, I came up to you and I said, You sound like Tina Turner. Yes, because <laughs> we, we were upstairs with Christy. Christy was running Christy Allergies. We were running vacation Bible school upstairs with Lisa and her and Allison. And our our sound system wasn't working. Jacqueline couldn't get the CD to work or whatever. And so I just started, I was like, we're gonna get it started, let's improv. And we started doing our song and everybody was dancing. And then later on, you told me. I told you, they sounded like Tina and you said, and well, by, said the, by the way, I played her. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like no, you didn't, you did Yes, I did. So so we saw the I told you, I told on. you, when, when you when you went home and you Googled it, were you like, wow, she was for real. <laughs> I don't think I needed to Google it to believe you. You wouldn't, nobody would randomly make that up. That's not, <laughs> so did you get to meet Tina? Yes, I did. Tell and, me. Oh my goodness. She is one of the most regal see, and refined people that you will ever meet. It's funny because, you know, people see her as like this larger than like wild, ferocious rock and roll girl. And that's not, She's very demure and ladylike and polite behind the scenes. Uh, during the press junket for the movie, I was doing different interviews. And I remember I had just finished doing Regis and Kathy Lee. That's when we had Regis and Kathy Lee still. And I was a guest on there. Right after that, um, Touchstone Pictures flew me back to LA and I went to Tina's concert and they took me backstage and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna meet her, I'm gonna meet her. And as soon as I walked in, she gave me this big hug and she was so calm and, and so quiet and you know, very different from what people would think. And then she looked at me and she says, now Raven, you see those shoes over there in the corner? You see those shoes? Those are my diva shoes. Once those go on, that's when I become Tina Turner. And I was like, oh, okay. And so once she put those shoes on, it was a whole nother thing. She was loud, she was dancing. I mean, the legs go on for days. You know, she's famous for those legs. And tiny little me, I'm just looking up like, wow, this is like life-size Barbie doll. So. so that was in the mid nineties, right? Uh, yes, that was in 94. So that was around the time that she had the hit with gold. Well, the movie Eye. came out in '93, June of '93. I just turned eight. I remember actually. Yeah. And then she had she didn't she write I don't really want to fight no more for that movie. Yes, movie. yes. So that was a hit, and then like a year or two later, she had that James Bond. Yes, she did the gold, Golden Eye. Yes, yes, yes. And I remember she was saying at the time she's she's like, well, I thought I was going to retire. I mean, this was back then, which of course she didn't retire till like 2009 or something, but. She said, uh, but when you're hot, you got to go. Oh, you got to go. You got to hit, hit the road. She's just fabulous, fabulous. Um, and just a beautiful spirit in general, just overall. Um, we, Sean and I recently were producing. We have a production company called Everlasting Entertainment. And one of our projects that we're doing, we want to attach her to one of our projects that we're doing. So, um, but that's that's another 
a whole nother side of me as well um, that we're trying to do. We want to bring Hollywood to Westerly. Well, we so want that, to. Yes, we definitely want to. Um, I I also, some other credits that people might remember, um, I did like ER. I played, I was on Hannah Montana as well. I played uh, Hannah Montana's brother's girlfriend, Olivia. Um, so those are just some other things. But what we're really trying to do right now is a labor of love that we're really, really big up about these two projects. One is called Christmas Kennel and the other one is called A United Christmas. And so we want to tie charities in with both of them. And um, Christmas Kennel is a story about a little boy who loses his dog over the holidays. And perfect, both of these movies are perfect setups for Hallmark or a Lifetime movie. And we have connections with Hallmark, so we're going to have them with them. So. Um, but uh, a little boy who loses his dog over the hol holidays, his parents, the marriage is on a rocky road. And long story short, through the love of Christmas and the love of the town of Westerly, because that's where it'll take place, um, the little boy actually does get his parents back together. Their marriage and their love is rekindled through the joy of Christmas and he gets his dog. And so with every project that we do at Everlasting Entertainment, which is um, our production company, um, we always have a charity that ties in with every single production that we do. So the charity that we chose was Stand Up for Animals, which is in Westerly, the Westerly Animal Shelter. Uh, so we had a wonderful meeting with them over there. And uh, the other project that we're doing is a love story, you know, your typical Hallmark love story, but it involves bringing in different parts of the community, your uh, Italian Catholics with um, your Baptists, your Christians, your Jewish people, uh, your Latinos in the community. And it's just basically a smorgasbord of diversity and love. And it's called A United Christmas. And the backdrop of that film is actually the United Theater, who you were just speaking to, um, Miss uh, Deborah Goodrich Royce and Mr. Chuck Royce, um, their theater, the United Theater, we want to be our charity that we uh, select for that film. And so we met with Mr. Tony Noons and, um, and, and we were just pleased to assist with that. So we're trying to get a United Christmas up and going. So that's one of our goals. We have celebrity cast, G-Ma, Marla Gibbs. Um, we wanna have her in that piece as well. One of my dear friends, um, Tatiana Ali, and uh, you may remember her from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Yeah. And uh, David Crumholtz, my god brother, David Crumholtz, who uh, you all remember from the Santa Claus. He was Bernard, Tom, uh, Tim Allen's uh, elf uh, assistant in the Santa Claus movies. He also was on the series Numbers as well. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. David Crumholtz, that's my god brother. So um, we we want to have David and Tatiana and g -Moff you know, Florence from the Jeffersons and that, and bring Hollywood to Westerly, you know, and then we can even put you in it, Caswell, put you on there too. Yeah, I play a really good mailman. <laughs> hey, Raven, thanks so yes. much for spending time with us tonight, and thanks for all you're doing, and you, you were a great person to have on our show, and thank you for sharing everything with us. Well, thank you. And really quick, I just want to give some great shout-outs to some wonderful nurses at Westerly Hospital, um, Mel Melody Bellinger, uh, Talita, Luna Stackpole, Samantha Seamus, and Madison Allen. Also um, want to do a big thanks to... Um, one of our, our contributors, um, uh, we had donations from South County Hospital, and we want to thank them as well. Um, the Rhode Island Hospital's ORI unit, Rachel Marie Castro. And we've been giving masks to not only Connecticut and Rhode Island, just so you know, we've been, we're sending to Dr. Levant Mutlu at Yale New Haven but also to Mount Sinai Hospital um, in New York. Uh, so we wanna thank uh, nurse Sasha, Sasha Winslow from Mount Sinai Hospital as well. So we, we're just so grateful to be able to help as many people as we can. We don't want people to forget to donate to Sisters Who Sew. Please go on our GoFundMe page, Sisters Who Sew. 
please go on there. We are accepting donations. We really need fabrics and uh, cause I'm running out. <laughs> I'm sewing and sewing and so is Allison. Um, we need for Rhode Island, New York, Connecticut, um, funeral homes and morgue workers. They're our forgotten heroes. They're actually dealing with the aftermath of this and they're firsthand dealing with touching the COVID patients um, that have passed away and we need to remember them for sure. And if you're a sewer out there and you wanna join our team, just private message me or contact Caswell, he'll get you in contact with me. We need more sewers to join our quest here. So, and we also wanna thank um, Connecticut Behavioral Health as well. Um, therapist Nora Gumpel there, Nora Gumpel is amazing. And we got her some masks that she's giving as well. Um, and she made a donation as well. We are very grateful to her, our therapist Diane Lumasetz and Dr. Amanda Spiker as well. So, and Samantha Lynn as well. She's a mental, mental health clinician uh, in Rhode Island. And so we just wanna say thank you so much Caswell. Thank you Ben as well. Thank you for doing this. It, it means a lot to us in the community. God bless thank you. you. Thanks Raven. Oh, and I, I would be remiss if I did not thank Father Sunil, I have to thank Father Sunil um, because Sister Suso started at Christ Church, okay? And I came to Father Sunil with this and I said, Father Sunil, can we use the church parking lot to collect donations? Can can you support us in that and, and get the word out? And right away, he was on top of it. So I wanna thank him, I wanna thank Jackie in the office. I also wanna thank you Caswell as well for getting the word out, so. You got it. Thank you, Raven. God bless you. Good night. All right. That was a full show. That was over an hour. Uh, crazy. We had two good guests. We had three good guests. We had Miss Allison. We had Raven, who you didn't know any of that stuff about her, did you? I brought you a good guest tonight. And, of course, we had Mrs. Uh, Deborah Royce, uh, who just in some awesome films, um, just, uh, an amazing book. I mean, the reception for finding Miss Ford is, uh, is unbelievable. And we thank her for taking the time for being with us tonight. And I hope that you've enjoyed the show tonight. I mean, every night we seem to have a great audience and you guys uh, seem to like it. We're trying to, you know, just get you away from, from this crap that's going on. Uh, I'll be uh, happy when this is over and I won't be on seven nights a week anymore. <laughs> um, but we've had some amazing guests. And speaking of amazing guests, tomorrow night is Billy J. Kramer. Uh, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas. He was signed by Brian Epstein, who managed the Beatles. He was from Liverpool, England. And John Lennon wrote his first couple of big, huge hits. One of them was called Bad to Me. Um, he had a bunch of hits in the 60s. His, uh, his drummer in his band is actually also was Billy Joel's drummer, Liberty DeVito. But Billy J. is a wonderful, wonderful musician. Um, who has a great voice and who's still packing the houses and still doing a great job. So tomorrow night, Billy J. Kramer is going to be with us and he's going to tell us all about those days in Liverpool, England in the early 60s. So I hope you join us for that. Um, I want to take a moment uh, to say a little prayer before we leave because uh, we do that almost every night, not every night, but almost every night. And a lot of people like it and they uh, they type the uh, amens, the amens um, in the in the uh, comment section. So we like the amen. Thanks, Mary. I know Mary enjoyed the show. Uh, really uh, great tonight. Tonight we had uh, some girl power on the show. We've had all guys on the show. <laughs> tonight we had we had all women. Um, so let's just get into a place for a moment where we can maybe think about things and be thankful for the things that we do have that uh, are going well in life. There's a lot not going well, but there's a lot that we still have to be thankful for. And if we could take a moment to just uh, say a prayer together. Oh God, your unfailing providence sustains the world we live in and the life we live. Watch over those both night and day who work while others sleep and grant that we may never forget that our common life depends upon each other's toil. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ and may sleep in peace. So that's it for tonight. I want to thank you all. we got much more to talk about in the coming days. 
but I'll see you back here tomorrow night at eight o'clock right here for another episode of Ask Caswell. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, mom.